review series. Take a load off from your busy workday and listen to the dulcet tunes of our guests who are all over the cybersecurity landscape. We're going to ask them some hard questions. Not going to lie, probably some softballs too. But no matter what, it's going to be a good time. So sit back, pour yourself a nice hot cup of coffee or something stronger if it's that time of day, and enjoy Coffee Talk with Serge. Welcome to Coffee Talk. We're doing an interview series once again with my good friend, although relatively unknown newcomer, according to ChatGPT 3.5 and 4.0, Jamie Williams from MITRE. Uh, for those of you who've never joined a Coffee Talk interview series, we like to kind of do a deep dive with a person who does some incredible stuff. Jamie has done very incredible stuff, despite generative AI's denial. Um, we usually talk about 35, 45 minutes, kind of depends on where the spirit takes us for the day. And we're going to go over some of Jamie's background and things he's interested in. And of course, we're going to talk about his incredible essay in Blue Nomicon. So, Jamie, who are you, since apparently generative AI doesn't know? Oh, thanks, AI. Another another strike in the notch there. Uh, but, yeah, thanks for having me. Genuinely uh, honored to be here. But a little bit about myself. My background is actually coming out of school. had no idea what I wanted to do. I thought, you know, uh, actually, funny enough, I went to college and played baseball. So I was like, hey, like, I'm going to do sports, and I should probably learn something while I was here. And thankfully, like, my um, advisor was like, Hey, I see all your like test scores. You should actually try in school too. Don't just like throw balls around because you know you're going to end up selling insurance uh, in the next five years. You dummy. So uh, I learned because I hear yeah. about the new market. Oh no, I would, that's that's like my next big horizon. But um, yeah, so I just kind of you know actually I learned I was not a traditional like computer person. Like didn't play video games growing up. Actually did like a struggled really bad in like my like first computer class, like 101 freshman year, I was like, this is not going to work out. But uh, I put my head down, was like, I'd actually, you know, eventually will find my way. And thankfully, throughout my career, I've had like really great mentors who've helped me like see, not only see the problem space a little bit better, but I think one of the bigger challenges is like for each individual seeing like where you're a best fit, like, you know, where are you actually enthusiastic and interested and actually driven to make contributions. So started off the big broad, like I'm going to do IT something, bounced around a little bit, got into security, got into more like, you know, government kind of work. And then eventually for the last six years, I've been at MITRE, uh, more pivoting into InfoSec, computer security, adversary relation, all the fun stuff, uh, attack. So yeah, just, you know, background was kind of non-traditional, but I actually think that non-traditional label is becoming a little bit more commonplace. So I see more people like exactly like myself who are maybe career transitioning or just, you know, it, maybe you have a background in something else, but you're just like always been interested in computers. So it's been fun to kind of measure and kind of, you know, provide feedback to people in that same boat, but also just see how the different paths and different ways life can take us. No, you that was can probably hear, not uh, what you were asking about. But well, no, yeah, good stuff. There, there's no wrong answer. <laughs> That's really, I mean, I asked where you came from, how you came up. I, I love the stories there. Uh, one of the things I'm really inspired with cyber is always the different paths that people take. And I think there's a preconceived notion that everyone started off with a computer science background in university and that they went in and you know, you're obviously not only more beautiful than I am, but a bit younger. Uh, my generation, like no one started in cyber. No one, everyone started as a sysadmin or a network admin or a developer. And then you eventually got really bored with those problems and you wanted something else um, where, you know, a, a generation younger than me, like yourself, you know, some of you started in school and but in IT or computer science yeah. and then went in. And then the generation even younger than us, like they're coming out of school with computer si security, cybersecurity degrees, which is a very different. It's an interesting path uh, that I yeah. find. Um you know, your time at MITRE, obviously, you've been a huge influence on MITRE ATT&CK. There's been some big changes there. If you kind of go through the last maybe three or four years as ATT&CK has matured, you know, I know yeah. talking to our good friend Adam, uh, Adam for from MITRE ATT&CK, like he talked about the hype curve and just the, you know, oh, my God, it's <laughs> every single RSA talk, every Black Hat talk, and then no one cares anymore, and now it's just now it's just, but it's, it's just the, yeah. is the basics of a lot of people's cybersecurity programs. So I'm curious from your view being on the inside, kind of what yeah. have you seen change? What are some of the, the more interesting outputs of that, that you've experienced? 
Yeah, I mean, it's funny, too, because, like, even now, we're just hitting, like, our 10-year anniversary with Attack. So we've been, like, going through a lot of old archives and looking at, like, the original, like, this is what Attack was created for. Um, and ironically enough, it was really, it was made to be a scorecard for red versus blue war games of, like, hey, we're doing, you know, purple teaming before it was purple teaming. We need folks to be able to talk to each other and point to something and say, you know, red team did this, did blue team see it, and blue team defended this, et cetera, et cetera. But... To answer your question, from the inside, it really hasn't changed. Like, I am always amazed when, like, we can find, like, the original, like, attack matrices and kind of the original documentation. We, I think in the spirit of a common language, a lot of the philosophical decisions and important things that make attack attack really have not evolved that much. I think where you're seeing that evolution is the hype curve is real. And I think that's amazing. I think that's awesome. Really appreciate that. But I think that's what keeps us honest in terms of, over time, attack is going to grow. And I think from especially our initial launch to about like 2019, it was grow, 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 more, more, more. We want more attack. This makes sense. We're people helping people, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's the dreaded, I know everyone is maybe still recovering 2020 sub techniques where, you know, for lack of better words, we looked at attack and said it doesn't fit on a slide. It kind of is breaking apart in terms of its ability to kind of communicate information efficiently. So we can't get wider. We can't get longer. We got to like condense this in a little bit. And I know people, uh, I remember the first time, like I actually had the honor of like presenting that for one of the first times in public. So I was excited. I was like, Hey, like by every, like, you know, what, what is the attack doing next? I'm standing in front of this audience and I'm like, Oh, by the way, we're doing this thing called sub techniques. Here's what it looks like. And I will never forget like the faces. It was a bunch of frowns. I, I think I literally got booed. They were like, "We will not use attack if you." Do I, I can't apologize enough for that again. It was um, <laughs> you know, the, the, I don't know why I even had Rotten Tomatoes with me. But, yeah, yeah. I, I still have the scar where you just hit me with a, an apple. I didn't, like not even a tomato. It was a fully ripe, you know, red delicious. That was awesome. Um, but yeah. So once we kind of got past that point of like we found, and I think that was a necessary like growth. We needed a uh, sub techniques enabled us to grow into the future and kind of where we are now. I've loved the output of like how attack is growing since that point. But really to your point, I think the most impactful and the most interesting development for attack recently has been keeping that same philosophy of everything grounded in the wild. Everything needs to be accessible, not just to PhDs and cyber. And like you said, you know, hardcore grizzled vets who've been in the industry for years, but also, you know, making back my own experience, First computer security class, I should be able to read a technique and like, oh, cool, this makes sense. I understand this. I can kind of work from this. So keeping that kind of universal perspective, but also something that we've been, you know, investing a lot of interest in is understanding how people are actually using attack. So not prescribing like thou shall use attack this particular way, or this is you need to be doing things the way MITRE says or ways like, you know, best practices, but really looking at we're putting this thing out for people to use and to make whatever you're already doing a little bit easier, a little bit more efficient, a little bit better. And re really connecting on our side, we need to stay in tune with that feedback loop and saying, how are you actually using it? Are we doing everything we can on our side to enable that? And can we learn from the way you're using it? You know, And I think that's one of my favorite things um, about kind of our community is they're not shy about sharing, hey, like, yeah, like you said, use attack for red teaming and threat hunting and detection engineering, but we're using it for, to quantify risk. We're using it to quantify this. We're using it to communicate, you know, IR and do these, you know, AI potential, you know, uh, force multipliers. But that's like the fun of this is it's like there's not like a, you know, yellow brick road. It's kind of like, here's a resource. Let's all like, you know, it's, it's on us to kind of be the shepherds of it. But let's just figure out where this takes us and let's just grow together and solve the real problems that we face. It was one of the years ago, Katie Nichols and I, formerly of MITRE ATT&CK, um, you know, she and I gave a presentation at Black Hat. And it was basically like all the ways that people screw up MITRE ATT&CK. And one of my favorite parts of that was really discussing the provenance of MITRE ATT&CK being really by threat intel analysts describe a taxonomy to kind of describe how things work. And that if people don't understand that, at least in 2019, yeah. it led them into problems because they're like, oh, this is how we fix all of our SOC problems. And it's like, well, it can, comma, 
you need to know the background <laughs> of why this exists. Because at the time, there yeah. were things like, you know, there was a minor technique for like using common protocols, which is super helpful when you're describing yeah. an adversary group. It's not helpful at all to write a detection that says, hey, people are using port 80. Like, are you still uh, seeing these yeah. sort of, um, I won't say misapplications. They're not misapplications, but the, it's a misunderstanding where people just try to apply a hammer of miter attack to every problem that's a nail. And sometimes yeah. you're just not going to be as efficient as possible. Do you find there's still things like that that pop up that you wish that people put more thought into or you could gently course correct or is smooth sailing now everything's fine and thank god we got rid of a pre-attack and miter <laughs> attack ics and um i can't keep up with all the frameworks you make it's hard <laughs> yeah i think you're, there's always going to be those misconceptions and those misunderstandings and that's something again we invest a lot of time and attention to is again i think the way you put it is like spot on like gentle course correction of like a good example is like attack for attribution of like hey I saw a cluster of these techniques, so it must be, you know, attack tells me this other group did that. So, you know, hey, one plus one equals uh, win it or win T or whatever. Um, that's, you know, definitely going to lead you to the wrong place. But I think more taking a step back, a part of like, besides just that course correction, I think one of the big investments has been, you know, I think exactly like you said, like attack is built from a CTI storytelling ter- narrative perspective. And I think it's really just educating people on that in terms of, hey, this is not a compliance list. This is not, you mentioned like taxonomy. Like, I don't like taxonomy, ontology, those like words just kind of make me like tighten up a little bit. This is like attack is closer to a dictionary of like, you're not going to tell you the right words. You're not going to have, you don't need to learn every word in the dictionary. But what it's going to enable you to do is as you're thinking of ideas, communicate it in ways that are um, well recognized and well understood and people can reference. So, you know, you're not saying, hey, lawyers need to have these hundred thousand words in their vocabulary and, you know, a doctor has, needs to have these hundred or thousand words in their vocabulary, but really like, hey, what's the overlap? How do we get doctors and lawyers to talk to each other? And I think that's what we're doing in this space is not just, you know, I think attack is naturally catered to security practitioners, but also like we've seen a lot of interest in executives. We've seen interest from, you know, procurement and marketing and product people and Everyone that it really, you know, and not to be cheesy, but like that whole mantra of it takes a village, like everyone kind of directly or tangentially involved security kind of has a story to tell. And what, you know, I think really what attack is capturing is that. So what? Like exactly like you said, like, hey, we're doing all this stuff. We're making all these decisions. But like, why? And I think like one of the hardest things, especially in computer security is getting that feedback loop of, am I, am I good at my job? Am I doing the right thing? And unfortunately, the only time you really get a lot of like tangible feedback is either a red team or a real breach. So I think what attack is, you know, enabling us to do is rather than going down, you know, those miscategorizations and kind of looking for truths, really like before we even start looking for answers, just making sure we're asking the right questions in terms of like intrinsically, it's almost like therapeutic looking at yourself and saying, Again, how do I feel I'm doing? Like, is this, are we bleeding in the right direction? How, where are we now? Where we need to be? And then attack being that kind of fodder behind that to help like craft and scope and shape that story. So, you know, we've hit a real strategic point here about the value or the whys of MITRE attack. But one of the questions I have that you know, people know that I'm fairly involved with MITRE attack, you know, all the you know, conferences and just you know talking about it and using it, they say, yeah, but how do you do it? And I go, that's a really fun question <laughs> for a nerd who isn't me. So Jamie, Unit 42 releases the hottest new report on APT Muggle Snatch. You look at this and go, oh man, I can't believe it. They didn't, they didn't label any of this. We're gonna have to do all this work. How do you go through? Is it like an automated tool? Is it you're sitting down with a, a matrix on your screen and a pen and paper? Like, how do you actually go through and pull out these primary source MITRE TTPs and yeah. label them? Yeah, we, we, it's the up, of the utmost criticality that we defend the muggles from snatching. I, I got to say, this is... Muggle this snatch is APT like, is that they're just... Mm, rap- con level, like, yeah, you got to get into it. Okay. It's, but um, so I think there's like we've obviously there's like we put out trainings, other people put out trainings, there's tools. You know, the way I always describe exactly this problem is attack is really at the, at the core 
just a dictionary or, you know, a Rosetta Stone of behaviors. Like what are adversaries doing? Why are they doing it? How are they doing it? Where are they doing it? What are they doing? Et cetera, et cetera. So I always like, especially like teaching new people to map to attack. I think everyone's always like, you know, you're, you're potentially overwhelmed or it's like daunting. You're like, look at this like matrix of, hey, there's 700 techniques and techniques. There's mobile, there's ICS, there's all this nuance. I don't want to be wrong. I think like my personal opinion is to take a step back and simplify it in terms of, hey, I'm looking at this unit 42 report or I'm looking at this log or I'm looking at these detections and I'm trying to map them to attack. Look for verbs like adversary did what? Adversary did this, they did that, like thing happened. And even just highlight, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, traditional, like print it off, get a highlighter or, you know, play around and paint, whatever, whatever your preference is, just highlight things that are happening, actions. And then from there, you can kind of like look at each individual one. And I think this is really what, besides just giving us a common language, like I think this is where attack helps us as analysts, particularly is for every one of those actions, you have to decompose it. Like, hey, ransomware, like after deployed ransomware, what does that mean? Like, let's actually decompose that into mechanics and really understand like, what do those words mean? Like adversary move laterally, adversary ran this command. So for every one of those things you highlighted, really taking a look of like, what are the like Lego blocks? Yeah, let's, let's break that down for a second. APT, model yeah. patch, uh, move laterally in the network. So the first question you're gonna say is like, great, there's a verb, they moved move. laterally. Yeah. How did they move, right? So then you're gonna yeah, work exactly. through this and say like, okay, did they PS exec? Did they telnet? Did they SSH? And that's what you're going to then ascribe. But at the end of the day, they move laterally, which ascribes to a MITRE TTP, right? Exactly, and I think it, it subscribe like, you get that mapping to a tactic. And then in this point, actually, one of my favorite things about this process is it kind of keeps you honest and gives you that feedback loop in terms of exactly like you're saying, telling the story of, hey, adversary move laterally. How? Oh, crap. I should probably put that in the report. Because yeah, if you don't know that, be, yeah. yeah. Or, or at least addressing, we don't know how, but like this is, this is what happened. And I think like you said it's really, and simplistically, it all starts with move. You're like, okay, cool. Like moving I can translate moving to attack, but if you give me more details on what movement is, I can get further and further down in the weeds and actually like act, you know, not to be cheesy again, make this actionable as defenders versus, you know, ransomware, scary adversary move. You're like, great. That sounds like stuff I can absolutely no, I like that. With. Like, especially for junior, not even junior analysts, but just people, one of my biggest issues is, well, liberal, liberal arts coming out here a bit, like, but writing. Um, like one of my biggest complaints when I had a day job, not just uh, drinking coffee and talking to beautiful, smart people like yourself, <laughs> was that cyber writes poorly. Um, me mm. speak good English, apparently, but we as an industry do not tend to write extremely well. I think threat intelligence analysts tend to be some of the best in the industry at this. Yeah. But especially when I would read malware reports or incident response reports from IR, it is very much, you know, PFM, right? Pure freaking magic. Like something, something happened, a black box, and then they're over here and they're in the network. And you kind of, my analyst brain goes like, cool, but like that part, like what happened yeah. there? And to your point, I think it's it's perfectly fine to say we worked really hard on this and we don't know, but it's not perfectly fine to just say like, well, it happened. Like, yeah. And this does give you the language and a framework to kind of go through. There is a finite number of ways that adversaries move through the network, which is one of the things I love about this. Like we are documenting and recording these verbs that adversaries are using and they had to move somehow. So how do they get from, you know, ingress of a spear phishing email with a dropper into the network? Like how do they get right. across the VLAN? And if you can't answer that and you're doing your internal mapping, that's a problem. And if you're reading a report and someone hasn't answered that or even talked about it, like you should think critically perhaps about it. Right. Right. It reminds me of like math class when you have to like show your work and you're like, yeah, I know what like four times 12 is, but like, Hey, the more I actually like, rather than just like writing the answer, like let's actually like document and kind of show that we actually understand all the mechanics behind that and that it's just 12 fours. Great. So I will say I'm probably in the minority. I love the subtechniques edition because 
you know, my good friend, a former colleague, John Stoner, I think does hold the record for the largest miter attack matrix ever displayed because he displayed <laughs> it at the IMAX theater in mm. um, B-Sides SF. And so something like, you know, 200 feet. And I don't think it all fit. Um, it probably didn't. So it needed to be shrunk. Um, Damn defense evasion, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you're always adding new TTPs. You're always adding new things. Um, what are some of the more exciting changes you've seen in the last couple of years that adversaries, you know, perhaps you didn't know or that's new technologies or new methodologies that didn't come up before? Yeah, I think the simplest answer to that is cloud. Um, really? That's something cloud? Like, did, yeah. did Fire Attack, Fire Attack <laughs> always did something with cloud, right? I don't think anyone's <laughs> yeah. ever given a public shaming presentation about this. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of baggage there. But yeah, I think it's, it's interesting too, because exactly to your point, um, and I think this is what subject needs really captured is now that we had like, we kind of, like you know dust settled we have our like map of the terrain for lack of better words of the matrix a lot of the growth we're seeing is to your point adversaries doing basically what we i mean attack attack is abstracted so it's not like you know we're not getting down to a quantitative like super yeah. scientific and you know the idea of what a technique is is kind of a miter creation absolutely but we're seeing a lot of just redundancy or like something like process injection you're like okay cool that's a recognized idea. There's sub techniques there for different categories, but even like the bubble of innovation, uh, we'll see a lot of like depth and new trade craft and new ideas, but it kind of, it still exists at that procedure level versus like a new sub technique. So honestly, a lot of our work is just going back and looking at old sub techniques and saying, Oh crap, we need to update this. There's like some really spicy stuff happening. But then I think where where we're really seeing like the noticeable growth in terms of like stoners, like IMAX, like if you were going to try that again, like the addition of new tech, like tactics and techniques is really coming from us taking again, like traditionally attack was like host based and a little bit of network and opening up that to things like cloud and things like, you know, you mentioned like pre-attack. Well, let's like let's hold there for a second though. Let's, let's give some credit here. My favorite thing about MITRE ATT&CK that I love from an educational point of view, it's all based on primary source material. So hmm. like everything in MITRE ATT&CK has a scientific notation that I can go through and say, this exists because of a publicly reported thing that I can go back through and see. And yeah. so full credit there, right? Like if no one talks about it, if no one's published about it, if no one's being open about it, and yes, this is a complete dig to our CSP cloud service provider brethren. Like if they're not <laughs> talking about it, you're not writing about it, right? Like this is, you, you're yeah. not necessarily just going to pull this like, well, I talked to a guy at a conference and seems pretty cool. We'll put it in. Like Exactly. And I'm, glad you, I'm glad you, you stopped me there because attack is absolutely community driven. It is like people like always thank us for, oh, like you might or thank you. Like it is absolutely like, flip that thing outwardly because none of this exists like from a again getting back to 2013 none of this exists philosophically without that in the wild backing that we can kind of use to actually create uh craft and create we're really just curating what people are actually already talking about into something that again can serve that rosetta stone but that that also presents a challenge because i think as exactly like you said a lot of people look to attack for how do i what matters to me where are my defenses and i think one of, to your point about kind of recalibrating and those miscategorizations or mis misappropriations of attack, one of the things we always have to foot stomp is attack as a starting place. Like it's a, you know, a model of a way to think about things. It's a blueprint you can use to extend, but you do need to extend it because in reality, you know, if I'm in a hospital or a huge enterprise or, you know, even a school system, my environment's not going to look as clean as a matrix. It's not going to be well, like really distinguished platforms of like, oh, here's my Windows stuff. Here's my Linux stuff. Here's my cloud. Super easy. It's going to be just a hosh posh of just mixed up stuff. And it's going to be much more complicated. There's going to be risk that you need to worry about that aren't intact. There's going to be things that, you know, you could probably find a couple of techniques and say, these are the only things I care about. The rest are just maybe things we can't defend right now. But exactly to your point, it all is very intrinsic. But it all kind of starts with, again, you looking at and saying, you know, rather than what does attack tell me I should do, what can attack help me understand better about myself in our situation and what we should be doing? It's one of the most fascinating conversations I had about attack was when I was in Australia working with a bank that primarily dealt with Southeast Asia. And mm -hmm. 
I was like, you know, and I was very much high on the miter attack hog. And I was like talking about, oh, it's great. And you do this. And like, man, it doesn't work for us. And I was like, what yeah. do you mean? And they're like, it's too American bias. And I was I like, mean, oh, like, yeah. I was like, yeah. Like everyone there is mostly former DOD or they're part of the U.S. government complex. Very few non-English speakers. And the majority of reports that are written are by U.S. vendors or Western vendors. And they're primarily in English. And they're primarily about adversary groups targeting Western democracy. And, you know, their big issue was, you know, we have a Pakistani branch of our bank and we have an Indian branch of our bank. And they are not necessarily nations that are friendly with each other, but no one's writing about the TTPs of these groups. And they just kind of went through like, oh, we have this Malaysian bank and we have this and we have that. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Like none of that's there. I was like, so are you extending the framework? And they get what? I was like, I mean, <laughs> like this is a uh, like you can extend it. And I pointed them. There's some great work. If no one's seen it, I think it was AttackCon one or two, uh, where some wonderful women from Deloitte talked about mm-hmm. how they extended and they just went through step by step how you can extend Mitre Attack for your own network. And I think that was just a great example where Mitre fully was like, "Yeah, we can't cover everything. You should. This is for the world. Do not, you know, do not come at us, bro." Yeah for not having all this stuff like we want you to bring it to us and we can bring it back out and back and forth or you know fork it and make your own internal because maybe you're seeing stuff faster than we can get through it like and i I love that about the spirit of the the miter attack team yeah at two points is i i was hoping you wanted to talk about biases because that's you you know you want to nerd out on something that's love language there and then again i despite i'm I'm really happy when i see people call this out online like you know um uh, on Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever people are. But like, despite what people believe, MITRE did not invent the idea of tactics, techniques, and procedures. It really just kind of borrowed it and contextualized it. So exactly to your point, like that blueprint and that schema and that way of thinking about like ransomware, like rather than just like worrying about ransomware or, you know, uh, you know, info stealers or whatever you're kind of worried about, like let's really, again, like you said, analyze and think about what does that mean? Why are they doing that? How are they doing that? And then what am I going to do about it? And I think that's that's really what attack is under the core. Um, it's just like let's just decompose things into thing into particular again getting back to the blue versus red red teaming and uh, war gaming. Like let's decompose these things that we needed to worry about and defend into tangible Legos that I can start to play whack a wall with, and I can decide to try to swing. I can try to not, but at least I'm like asking that right question, seeing the problem for what it really is. So, Jamie, we've talked a lot about MITRE ATT&CK. I did want to come back to the great and extremely well-paid mm-hmm. essay that you wrote for us, uh, which I believe is just in Friendship and Beer. Um, for those of you who don't <laughs> know, Jamie wrote a really great, actually, it's been one of the most best-received, actually, essays in our Blue Nomicon book, and we'll have a link for downloading the PDF later, The Blue Pulse of Security Operations. Jamie, for those of you who haven't read it, could you kind of give us a summary and kind of go over the what, why, how, why, oh. what? Yeah, that was, that was a fun one because I was like talking to Mick and he was like, hey, like super stoked. And you got a bunch of good ideas, like really want to hear from you. Um, but like I think the one uh, like caveat was like, eh, I don't really want to hear like the, the classic like, you know, teenage drama, like purple teaming stuff. Like give me a little bit more. So I, I was like, that's perfect. That's like could not ask for a better Did challenge. Like the, Riverdale, the Riverdale essay. That's yeah, it. I was like, I, I, I'll do you. I'll do you a solid. I understand, and I, I love that kind of like you know step up. Um, I, I, you know, not saying purple teaming is bad, but we've all read that a million times. No, no that's what I heard. Um, let's make sure we all tweet out at Jamie Williams hates purple <laughs> teamers. Hashtag blue team life forever. Canceled. So, yeah, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Well, I think they canceled. Why? Uh, oh, you don't want to go into it. It's disgusting. <sighs> purple, purple, purple. That's me and Grimace just going down together. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, so I thought about it like for a long time, and I was like, okay, cool. Like from my background, and like you know, traditionally, I, I kind of see myself more on like the red leaning side from both like a history, historic, but you know, future interest perspective. But really, I didn't know that. That's yeah, fascinating. Yeah, I did, did some like cyber. Is it hard being wrong or yeah. it, you, you get used to it, you get numb. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. You can't let failure uh, hold you back. You just gotta keep pushing yeah, through. Less, like, that's our motto. Yeah, so. yeah. You can't be you can't be gatekeeped if you don't look at the knowledge <laughs> gates. You just kind of blur through them or walk yeah, around. I mean, uh, you'd be really upset if you could read. Yeah, that's the- <laughs> good. Good meme ref there, but yeah. 
So I was just thinking about like, you know, how do we, like, what really is purple teaming? Like, why, why was that my first thought? Cause like even Mick, like, like drilled it. I was like, Hey, like, I don't even think I said it, but he was like, Hey, don't, hey, please don't write that. And I was like, yeah, like you knew where I was going and I'm glad you said that. So I just took a step back and thought about like, what is, what do I actually like about purple teaming? Like, why was that my first thought? And I think exactly like the title captures, it's like, really like a good way to think about purple teaming is just like blue teaming done like the way it was intended we're really you know we're thinking about like why do we do red teams why do we do threat intel why do we do you know uh, asset management and vulnerability management and really it kind of all comes back to a, at the core we're all defenders you know we think we're doing we're doing threat hunting we're doing detection engineering but it all kind of comes back to the same pulse so really um hopefully that you know, essay captures that and kind of puts that into perspective in terms of, again, very similar to attack as we're doing all these, like, you know, we're doing procurement, we're doing, you know, we're briefing executives, we're doing sales, we're looking at product evaluations and configurations, whatever we're doing, always just kind of take a step back thinking like, why am I doing this? And I think it all kind of coalesces and comes back to like, we are trying to, you know, detect and mitigate the baddies. So, you know, and I think where this actually like materializes is not only recognizing that, but realizing like, hey, we're all kind of in this same boat together. I need to communicate. I need to learn how to communicate back to these different stakeholders. I need to understand how they see things. And I think that's really what this like, you know, smoke of purple teaming is really trying to highlight of, hey, like you can't just be leap hacker. You can't just be you know, slick threat hunter who can't talk and sit at a table and tabletop and do all the things that really impacts the defense of an organization. You really have to kind of play ball and like see where you fit at the you know table of counsel or whatever. I think one of the biggest changes I've seen in the industry over the last 10 years or so is the realization, I think the red team world grew up and Full admit, I have a complete bias here. I acknowledge this, uh, but no one cares about the red team unless it improves your network defenses. And so every red teamer who just like popped a shell, done. Like that does nothing. Like yeah. if I'm a CISO and I'm looking at like who to lay off, I'll be honest. Like if you're a red teamer or a pen tester and all you do is just like got the flag, got my money, I'm out. Like you're not providing value. Like the value for a red team is someone who works with a blue team. Like, hey, we got through the network. Here's the steps we took. Do you have detections here, here, and here? Like, and also I think one of the big advantages to me about purple teaming is the adversary emulation yeah. because – I find that red team, I once had a, a very fun, actually, this is a great call out for minor attack. So years ago, Dave Harold and I created something called Boss of the Sock. And everything we did on Boss of the Sock was mapped to real world primary use cases, and they were all mapped to MITRE attack. And so the nice thing there was every TTP we did had a MITRE attack TTP, and then we were able to go back through and find a real world, like, okay, this was a report written up by Mystic. This was a report written up by Volatility. This is like, here's the method that was used, and we're doing adversary emulation because we're saying, like, hey, the APT Taedong Gong is a group of Slime Time and Lazarus combined. So we're pulling from both. Fine. We gave a workshop on this, and I had a, a, a relatively young new career person, and she was a red teamer, and she said, this is complete bullshit. No one would ever do this. I would do it this way, this way, this way, this way. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you would because you're a red teamer. And she's like, yeah, and that's why you're wrong. I was like, well, first off, here's the documentation showing that basically somebody just clicked on a link. So like, not wrong. Second, you're financially incentivized to do really cool things because you work for a red team company that – has a, a reputation built around doing really cool, innovative hacking. Yeah. Most adversaries in reality are paid to get something out using the least amount of effort as fast as possible. And so the the motivations are different. So for me, it always came down to like, oh, you did this really cool ninja thing, but you could have just walked in the front door and taken the TV and walked back out. Like you didn't have to do the Tom Cruise halo jump through the sky roof after 40 hours of you know observation. It was just like literally walk in and say, howdy, I'm the TV inspector. I'm here to take your TV out for an inspection done. Very right. long way of saying like for me, 
that's been the big change. And I'm seeing this in the red team world of just acknowledging like we should be doing what the blue teamers are failing yeah. at rather than just causing blue teamers to feel bad about themselves over and over again. And I think some of what you're talking about there, MITRE ATT&CK facilitates this because it is real world verbs. Like yeah. it's not the esoteric, it's not the fanciful, it is just the meat and potatoes of ingress via PowerShell. Yeah. Just do PowerShell. That's it. That's the the big three rules of red teaming are exactly like you said. Make it real. Make it matter. Two, like you said, couldn't say it better. If you break it, you bought it. Like not allowed to find problems and not be there to help figure out like remediation. And then of course, our favorite third: no shirt, no shoes, no service. I mean, you need to add the fourth. Ninety percent of your job is just writing up the report. Mm, writing the report well. Yes. I think that's that's one of my favorites. You, you know, we're talking about red team times attack, like rather than this like forty page report about a bunch of like you know Cobalt Strike Flu and a bunch of like GitHub scripts that were super awesome, but like hey, like this people you know sitting in a sock twelve hour shift or you know sock manager who's got a million things going on, they're not going to have time to read this. They're not going to have it, all the context. Let's just paint them a pretty picture and say red team did this, and more importantly, get that critique and that feedback of exactly to your point. Do you, the, the stuff we did, does that actually matter to you? Or are we just kind of like over here hammering away at something that, you know, you don't even, not a priority? How can we align with where the projects and initiatives and priorities that are already in place? How can we be a force multiplier versus being off to the side and being like, oh, red team's like over here finding holes in like a house we haven't thought about in years. And we don't, this is, we're deprecating that next year. So great job, guys. Yeah, I, I love it when I see a, a security organization that's just, I don't want to say combined, but just they're interlaced. It is just a, mm. a true partnership. And the way I see the best CISOs doing that is fiscally motivating. So it turns mm. into a, as you said, like you don't get to, you break it, you bought it, same sort of thing. Like the blue team needs to work with the red team of finding and closing out those issues. But the red team then needs to do a test back afterwards to verify. And then that kind of goes through and then you pull in the thread intel and that's where you get that nice loop and everyone's working together. And that's usually the best way I've seen it. It's um, funny too, because like you can tell all the folks, especially who have like an intel background, because I think it in the same way we think about like PIRs or information needs, you can kind of apply that same mantra to like yeah. red, blue, threat hunts. Like you need to have shared goals, shared objectives and like communication. Otherwise everyone's off doing who knows what, and it, like you said, there might have that gross word. I hate it, but the only word I can think of off the top of my tongue, that synergy. synergy. That all. Yep. Yeah. Uh, when you use it correctly, it's not wrong. Holistic and synergy are two words that can be used correctly, just mm. they aren't. So. It's such a good word when in, in the right context. I, I, I try not to, but it's just sometimes it's just the one. There you go. Um, we are pretty much at time, Jamie. I just have one question left. If you were to do a MITRE ATT&CK, um, you know, April Fool's Day, what would it be? Oh, <laughs> I I actually have like a text document with like a bunch of candidates because that's actually something we take very, very seriously. Like April Fool's mm. is a fun day for us. Um, we've had some bangers in the past. Like the uh, we did, ironically, we did attack for containers. Before that happened, that was a fun one. Flailing as a tactic was hilarious, like adversary goofs. Um, I was always it, thought just get commands because that's the, yeah, yeah troubleshooting, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, defense, like instead of defense evasion, I forgot the word, but it was like defense oh, yeah. like, config instead of, IP yeah. Config, yeah, great. Like, you know, you know, doing, paying your taxes on the, the victim machine and like typing your social security number. Never, 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 seen never, that. never, never seen that. Um, I think it, I, I probably have too many at, like options that I ironically can't remember now to give you a good answer. I think it'd be funny to like just 404 the site for a day and see it, it, like not not like not like humbly i just think it'd be interesting to see like if attack disappeared for a day like just just have a 404 that waits for one minute and then pops up the donation mm. page yeah there you go <laughs> yeah just adam's I'll, face looking very pensive i'll always be closing yeah, yeah. You, go. you gotta get your uh pay what you can but at least twenty dollars yeah, the wikipedia yeah. Um, yeah, there you go. Ooh, that'd be a good one too, is like make attack a true wiki, like an edit I, button. And like everyone can just go nuts. Yeah, there you go. Have fun. <laughs> right like I said, we got to pop up the uh, the little banner with a really sad Adam face of like, <laughs> you want Adam to have more hats and a job, please contribute what you can. 
Yeah, I'm a big fan of Sarah McLaughlin, so yeah. uh, you know we're good there. I, I will sing that for you in a MIDI. He's going <laughs> to upload it like a GeoCities working construction man. It'll be great. Mm. So, all right. Well, Beautiful. Jamie, thank you so much. Uh, it's always great to see you. I know you guys have a lot of things coming up. Mitre Attack Con is in October, right? What's this? Four or five? Absolutely. Yeah, um, four. Four. Very exciting stuff. There's always new things. You're always on the road and presenting. So keep a keep a watch out. Thank you everyone for joining. And we will obviously be back next week with another episode of Coffee Talk. So thank you everyone and thank you, Jamie. Thanks for having me. Pleasure was all mine.